Good morning. I'm Jade Floyd with the Case Foundation, and welcome to Austin. We are here at South by Southwest at the American Cities House, sponsored by Tetco and the Kauffman Foundation. So throughout the day, for the next few hours, we're going to have about a dozen influencers, investors, startup ecosystem builders, and entrepreneurs here in our Tetco studio to discuss inclusive entrepreneurship. So I am thrilled to be joined this morning by our very first guest. We're breaking it in with Emily Chang. Emily is a host of Bloomberg and also the author of a new book that was just released this month. Well, last month, actually. Broke Forties and fifties, actually, women played vital roles in the computer programming industry. They were programming computers for the military and programming computers for NASA. Mm -hmm. And then in the sixties and seventies, the industry was exploding, and it was so desperate for new talent that they started doing these uh, aptitude and personality tests to identify good programmers. And they hired two psychologists to develop a personality test, and those psychologists decided that good programmers, quote, don't like people. Huh. Well, if you look for people who don't like people, the research tells us you'll hire far more men than women. But there's also no research to support this idea that people who don't like people are better at this job than people who do, or that men are better at this job than women. Mm -hmm. But these tests were widely used for decades by tech companies as big as IBM and have perpetuated this idea of the antisocial, mostly white, male mm -hmm. nerd stereotype that a lot of people think of when they think of people who are good at computers and unfortunately that stereotype has shut out not only 50 percent of the population but you know a lot of people who could have thrived in this industry exactly and i think about all of the people who could have started the next facebook or the next google but were never given the chance because they didn't yes. look the part so talk to us a little bit about you've had interviews with a number of influencers couple of female executives that I'd love for you to share with our audience. Who were some of those figures that you spoke with? Many female executives. So I spoke with Sheryl Sandberg, the COO of Facebook, Marissa Meyer, who was then CEO of Yahoo, Susan Wojcicki. Jen Hyman of, of Rent the Runway. Um, the Google uh, women, I, I think their story is so fascinating because these are women who, you know, are right now, you know, some of the very few women who have broken through the silicon ceiling, mm -hmm. if, you, if you will. Um, and, you know, Larry and Sergey, the, the founders of Google, really focused on hiring and prioritizing women in the very early days. And as a result, they got Susan, who built uh, the ad model and yes. Cheryl who scaled it and Marissa who do designed the minimalist user interface that we all use today and they were critical to the success of Google which you know by the way when this company started there were 14 or so other search engines competing for dominance Google's success was far from a sure thing mm -hmm. but because of the contributions of these women who brought in different management styles and new business models you know Google became Google mm -hmm. but over the years the company sort of lost focus on you know d diversity as as a priority and a number of companies in silicon valley uh, seem to have done the same ab thing absolutely um and google's numbers are simply average and you know across the industry those numbers are are fair tech company or a startup mm -hmm. and the lesson in that for me is a this needs to come from the top this needs to be an explicit priority of the ceo mm -hmm. and b it needs to be you know not the 10th or 15th thing on the list but number one two or three and year after year after year, because otherwise it is just so easy to go back to average, mm -hmm. and average is just not good enough. It's not. It's not going to change the numbers if we're to increase venture capital for both female entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. for entrepreneurs of color, mm -hmm. and increase the number of those two demographics in tech. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about you know some of the lessons learned, obviously, from your various interviews, and you know what really is the number one 
lesson learned from both the interviews as well as your experience being based in Silicon Valley? One is it's never too late. Like start now. We all have things that we can we can do today and start early mm -hmm. because the longer you go without thinking about these things, the harder it is to change. Mm -hmm. I spoke to former Twitter CEO Dick Costolo, you know, who who said, you know, once you're you're past 20 employees, you're swimming upstream. Mm -hmm. It is really hard to turn that ship around. And that he, he as he quotes it, the underlying disease of a lot of these companies is that 90% of them are men. 90% of decisions are being made yes. by men. And we're talking about products that billions and billions of people around the world use. I think we, we often take the people who make the things in Silicon Valley for granted. Like we don't think about who's behind the scenes at Facebook or who made my iPhone or who, yes. you know. Who programmed who, Alexa? How, you know, <laughs> why are the search results in this order yes. on, on Google? Who pro programmed Alexa? And the, the reality is the vast majority of those people are men. Yes. But this is an industry that has extraordinary power over our lives, that is changing the way we shop and the way we communicate and the way we get around and the, you know, building the video games that our kids are using and the social media that they use. We need people of all backgrounds building these products. It is not just tech's problem or Silicon Valley's problem or a problem for people who want jobs, though it certainly is a pe problem for those people. Yes. It is a cultural problem. It's a problem for all of us, but I'm optimistic about this despite okay. the numbers and despite that the fact that the numbers have in fact gotten worse over the last um, few decades because I fully believe that the people who are taking us to Mars and building self-driving cars and have given us Alexa and mm -hmm. Uber and rides at the push of a button, they can change this. They can. You know, this is an industry that never shied away from hard problems like connecting the world and organizing the world's information, they can, you know, hire women and pay them fairly. Absolutely. So before we conclude today, I want you to tell us a little bit about your show on Bloomberg because I want to make sure that everybody tunes in daily to watch. And, you know, closing statement, tell us what you want everybody here watching on Facebook today to go out to do within their own companies, with their own startups, um, and the places that they are going to work at every single day. What's the one thing that they can do to change the narrative about, about who can be in the industry? My show is Bloomberg Technology, and I've been hosting it for eight years on Bloomberg Television. I also do a long-form show, uh, Bloomberg Studio 1.0, where mm -hmm. I go more in-depth with, with influencers. Um, and you know, this is where I get to talk to you know some of the most incredible tech executives every day. You've talked and to Steve Case, our I've founder. I've talked to Steve Case many times. <laughs> many times. We're both from Hawaii. We have that yeah. in common. We went to the same high school. Um, and you know, I love I love the opportunity that I have to sort of have this this like front row seat essentially to to Silicon Valley. And over the years, I've really been passionate about you know women's involvement in tech and so I've often asked executives what they think is wrong and what we can do about it but I found that nobody is ever as honest in an on-camera interview as they are mm -hmm. off-camera and so I felt that that's why I the only real approach I felt that would work was was to do it in, a, book. in a book um, and it's not all bad news in here there are bright spots there are people doing some incredible things and I think what everyone can do is I mean, there's so many practical solutions and nuanced solutions in here, so you have to read the whole thing. Okay. Um, but is listen. And I think we all need to listen to each other right now. And my biggest fear is that what's happening with the Me Too movement and the Time's Up movement is that this is just a moment and not yes. really a movement, that this won't lead to lasting change. But I do believe that this really is a movement and an inflection point where, you know, for the first time, women are being listened to. And not only do you have to speak up, do we all have to speak up, but we all have to listen, men and women. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. All of you, be sure to check out Brotopia. It is available online and in the bookstores that remain in existence. And I love indie bookstores, by the way. Good. And there's plenty in Austin. So all of you here at South by in Austin, um, be sure to pick up a copy. And thank you so much, Emily. We appreciate it. And we appreciate you bringing to light the culture that is Silicon Valley and giving us some insight on how we can make that change. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks Absolutely. for shining a light on these topics. Absolutely.